Well, Good happy morning. happy Friday, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to what we hope to be an ongoing event to highlight capital projects that Capital Region Water will be undertaking in the coming year. As of November 20, 2020, the last time that we updated our board on our MWDBE program accomplishments, Capital Region Water spent an estimated $9.7 million on six capital improvement projects. Of that amount, 1.5 million was committed to MWDBE part participation. Building on prior years, since 2017, at the inception of our business diversity program, CRW was, has awarded over 30 capital improvement projects, totaling $7.8 million in MWDBE participation. With the addition of our professional services, this would bring our total to 11 million dollars committed to MWDBE participation. We'll be looking even closer on our use of professional services and the development of a policy that aligns with our MWDBE program for our consultants that we use as well. If you don't already know uh, the importance of uh, business diversity uh, programs for economic development, within communities, Google that. Uh, it's, there are fascinating articles to read uh, about why that's important uh, in a community. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce and Andrew Enders, who is our Assistant Secretary and Treasurer of the Capital Region Water Board. Um, he also chairs the Outreach and MWDBE and Legal Committees for Capital Region Water. Andy? Good morning. Thank you, Charlotte. And thank you, Jarvis. Good morning. Uh, I, I will first point out that, yes, uh, for those of you at home that are wondering, this is a, a Snoopy Joe Cool sweatshirt uh, because uh, I have taken advantage of pandemic to grow out my hair and stop wearing suits every day. So it's been quite a wonderful experience for me, but it takes nothing away from the work that I do with Capital Region Water. And I, I sincerely want to impress upon this entire group today the importance of our MWDBE programming for Capital Region Water because the board believes, just as Charlotte shared, that an, a, a vital living, breathing MWDBE program is impactful to our community. And because the board is responsible to our ratepayers, we believe that a robust MWDBE program is a meaningful way to contribute back to our ratepayers. So I offered uh, to join today for a bit so that I could really stress that this is a, a program that runs throughout the organization top to bottom. Uh, we're consistently and constantly trying to improve it, refine it, and make it a little bit better. I think we're doing a pretty good job. I really want to compliment Charlotte, Jarvis, uh, Tanya, uh, everybody at CRW that, that is on this almost every single day in some capacity. So I'm really excited about today's uh, session, I believe that it's going to be an excellent opportunity uh, to drive some good communication, healthy dialogue, learn a little bit about one another and build relationships. And as those relationships are strengthened through that personal contact, even if it's through Zoom, uh, I believe that our outcomes are going to be better for CRW, our vendors and contractors, and most importantly, our ratepayers. So Jarvis, thanks for the invite today. No problem, Andy, no problem. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jarvis Brown. I'm the Diversity Program Manager. Um, I would like to personally thank um, all of you for attending um, today's event. This is our first uh, virtual project kickoff and networking event of the year. Um, some of you I've uh, been able to speak to. Um, I, I'm really overwhelmed at the amount of pr uh, participation um, that we have gotten um, for this event. We have engineers on the line. We have um, consultants on the line. We have other professional services, printing services on the line. Um, I could, the list can go on and on. Um, as of yesterday, we had almost 70 registrations and I do hope that all 70 attend today. We have a pretty packed schedule today. I know I had some questions concerning, they said, this is three hours and you know, what are we gonna be doing? So I'm not, so um, you know, without delay, um, I'm gonna go right in and explain uh, a summary of the day and then we'll be able to go into our networking sessions. So the first thing that we have on the agenda is our networking breakout sessions. Um, our goal is to have everyone into breakout rooms. Um, there is possibility depending on how many is on the line that there will be two to three people per room. And we really 
um, encourage um, communication, um, the exchange of information, let others know what it is that you do. We have a lot of MWDBEs on the line. There were a lot of um, contractors that have already worked with CRW on the line. And for all the other professional service on the line, there's also a place for you. Um, so um, please don't be shy when we get in those breakout rooms, exchange information. Um, there's no telling what can come from that. Um, we also have Freddie Lutz on the line. He's a director of strategic planning and client development for PEMBID. Um, he will be on the line to um, uh, educate on how to use PENBID, any updates to PENBID. He is the expert on that. And um, he'll be with us later on after the breakout sessions um, to do his, uh, conduct his presentation. We did leave time for question and answers, um, you know, to, to be involved in something like this, especially an education session such as PENBID. Um, it, it would be only right to be able to ask question. Um, and we also have um, the 2021 project kickoff. And that will include um, me um, presenting um, cherry pick components of the MWDBE program, um, Jeff Broray, our lead engineer, and Claire Wahart, our uh, professional landscape architect. Um, and there will also be a question and answer period um, after that also. So you'll get a chance to um, ask our, our engineering team and uh, me um, questions directly and hopefully we have answers and if not, we have our contact information available um, if there's um, a question or something that we may not have the answer to right now. And that is um, this uh, summary of what you can expect for today. And you guys should be able to see my screen now. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Okay. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. So again, I want to thank uh, folks here at Capital Region for putting on this event. I'm really thrilled uh, to take part of it. And clearly I'm looking through the list of attendees here and I'm seeing a lot of familiar names and faces. So great to connect with everyone. Um, I think we're all feeling that social anxiety from being away from each other for the past year. So it's great to see some people in person again like this. Um, so since we have a lot of people who are familiar with the system, um, I know we have a couple of newbies in, so I'm going to make sure I cover the basics, but I really want to cover uh, the bidder's perspective of PenBid. So um, big thing I want to make sure that we're looking at here is the self-registration process. So how do I become a member of PenBid? What is it, you know, how, how do I go about those steps? So we're going to walk through that. I'm going to show you some of the account management features that are available to bidders. Um, there's actually a lot there available for you. And I know a lot of you are probably using some of the surface features that are readily available. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the weeds today to show you uh, some of the, the additional capabilities uh, that you can control as a bidder. And then we're going to get into uh, how do you find bids? How do you submit on bids? Uh, I've actually have a couple of projects lined up to be able to show and showcase a wide variety of features and capabilities or conditions that you might encounter so that you're familiar of, of how to work that. And then the last thing, hey, what do you do if you need any help? Because uh, you know, that's always a, a thing that we pride ourselves in is yes, we're a, an e-company. Uh, we don't have any brick and mortar offices, but we pride ourselves in our customer support and being there to help whoever needs help in whatever shape or form that is. So not just the posting agencies, like Capital Region who are posting and managing their projects, them, HRG, the variety of consultants that are, are, that are on the system. But sometimes the bidders at the last minute trying to get their bids and they're like, oh my God, I'm running into a problem, what do I do? Well, we're here to help you as well. So with that said, I actually wanna jump into, <clears throat> I don't wanna to get too much of a dog and pony show there. So what we're looking at right now is the penbid.net marketing page. So we actually have two separate websites. Penbid.net, if you haven't been there, I would encourage you to go. We have a ton of resources, FAQs, all kinds of, of information here about the program. So for those of you who don't know what Penbid is, we're basically an online bid management solution. 
So we bring the bidding process, which historically has always been rooted in paper. So purchasing physical plans and specs and going and picking them up and then putting together a whole bunch of paper as a part of your bid and submitting that and running through traffic at the last minute, trying to get things to the, uh, the, the posting agency. And by that time, God forbid you'd be a couple minutes late because they're not going to be able to accept it if you are. So with PenBid, that entire process is done electronically. So now you can relax, you can take advantage of working from home, kick back in your PJs and your fuzzy slippers, get all the documents you need, ask questions, uh, participate in virtual pre-bid meetings if that's how the agencies have them and submit your bids from the convenience of your desk. And you can make any changes at any point in time. So extremely convenient. So when you come to the penbid.net, again, this is our marketing site where you'll have access to uh, a wide variety of resources. But if you'll notice right here, there is also a link to our active bid site. So the active bid site is where the actual posting and managing of bids happens. And for obvious reasons, we've split that apart because of the security that goes on in that environment. So when you click on that active bid site button, that'll bring you to a login page. And obviously if you're already a user, you'd simply type in your email address, password and come in. But if you're a new company, you're like, hey, how do I set up a new account? You see there's a register button right here. You simply click on this and that's gonna open up a page where you can come in and type in all of your particulars. So again, PenBid is self-registration. You can go in, set up these accounts whenever you want for bidders. So if we have any people out there that are looking to use PenBid from the posting agency side, only us here at PenBid can set up those accounts. But bidders can go in, set up your accounts and all that stuff. So again, when you go through this process, it only takes a few minutes and it doesn't cost anything. So there's no subscriptions fees, no registration fees, anything like that. So again, you click next. Uh, there's just a couple of steps there. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the entire process because I'm not actually setting up account, but it's very intuitive, very self-explanatory. So from there, when you get your account set up and you log in, that's gonna bring you to a homepage within the active bidding site. And right here we can see um, I'm currently logged in, but I'm logged in as a bidder. So this is the same perspective that most of you in the audience will have today. Now, the first thing I wanna do here is go to the My Account tab over on the left-hand side. So over on the left, uh, over on this control panel, Sometimes this will be minimized and you're seeing a bunch of icons and you're not quite sure what they are. So I like to point out, there's always the ability to maximize or minimize to see the full names there. But when you go to the My Account, here's where there's a, the capability of managing all kinds of elements of your account. So this couple of sets of tabs up at the top here, starting at the first one, the Info tab. That's where you can have the name of your company, your website address. Uh, you can upload documents. We have a number of bidders who've uploaded qualifications, packages, or maybe marketing or uh, information about their company. The posting agencies, so that all of the public agencies on the other side of the system have access to your information. And at times they may be looking through. So it's not a bad idea sometimes to put some of your marketing literature there so they can peruse that at their convenience. Now down here, we can see there's a categories and a state and county area, two different selectors here. So the categories, this is where we identify what type of work do we do? So when I click the edit button here, you'll see it opens up a big list. Now this list is based on the NIGP codes. That's the National Institute of Government Purchasing. So it's an industry-wide standard set of codes. And you'll see it's literally everything under the sun. So let's pretend, hey, I'm a, a baker and I provide bakery equipment or all kinds of goodies. So every product or service imaginable is identified here. So what you do, make sure you have the appropriate category selected based on the type of work or products that you provide. 
And again, when you save those changes, I'll come back up here, I'll save those changes and it'll refresh. And we can see now that, okay, if it's added the additional bakery uh, element there. Now on the right-hand side, we choose what geography do we, it, are we interested in working in? So I wanna pop this open here quick. And so first of all, I wanna start off with, a lot of you may recognize PenBid. Uh, the name's a little bit of a giveaway. We were born here in Pennsylvania, but we are not limited to Pennsylvania. So we've recently expanded to include a broader geography. So some adjoining states, Ohio, Maryland, Delaware, New York. Again, um, we're very sensitive to the enabling legislation that allows public agencies to do bidding electronically, which is why we're somewhat selective in obviously the states who have very similar requirements as Pennsylvania. But a lot of times we have uh, folks, the bidders in the audience who work in multiple geographies. You, you work in a mid-Atlantic region. So you can come in here and identify in any of the states, what counties are you interested in working on? And let's say you want all the counties in Ohio, you can simply select Ohio and that defaults to everything. So again, you would simply save whatever changes you are making there. So what happens is when a posting agency has a project that goes live in the system, you will receive an invitation as a registered bidder based on the type of work that you do and where the project is located. So what's great and convenient for the bidders is you don't have to poke the, around through the system and kind of filter out and figure out what's relevant to you and is it close by and worthy of you looking at it. Those invitations will fall directly into your inbox. At any point, you can always peruse the system to see what else is out there. But in terms of the email notifications that you'll get, you're not gonna get bombarded by a bunch of stuff that has no relevancy to what you do. Now down below here, we have the company addresses. So if you have multiple locations, uh, again, there's a lot of companies out there that might have offices in multiple areas. The engineering design firms are a great example where they might have you know, five, six offices around the state. So you can have all of those locations listed as well as all of the various internal contacts. So again, you can have as many people within your pen bid user group as is necessary. So uh, if you have new people coming on board, joining your company, you can have one of your existing pen bid users go in and simply add them to your accounts. Now there is place down here at the bottom to include any types of certifications. So uh, again, we do have some people to, that like plugging in their DBE credentials or certifications based on where they have it. Is it through UCP or through one of the other uh, more geographically centered things? So again, you can put those here. We have some agencies doing things like responsible contractor ordinances and whatnot. So again, keep in mind, this is not a place to put things that are required as a part of unique or specific project requirements. These are there just for general reference that the posting agencies would be able to peruse at their convenience. So again, this is just kind of that initial uh, account management. So one of the common questions that we often get is I get so many emails, is there any way I can limit what emails I'm getting communications for? Because email overload is a real thing. So, one of the things that we always start off with is, hey, you know, make sure that you have the correct categories, that you don't have too many, because <laughs> you're going to start getting a bunch of notifications for projects that might not be relevant to you. And also be very sensitive to, <clears throat> pardon me, the geographies that you have selected. So, you know, if you really don't work through an entire state, well, then maybe you don't want to have the entire state worth of counties selected. So again, there's some things you can do there proactively to manage that. But sometimes you don't want to filter just by such broad category. You say, oh, I really just don't want to receive very specific communications on a particular project or from a specific agency. I'm really hoping there's none of the bidders on this 
meeting today that we'd want to block out capital region, but you could if you wanted to. Uh, certainly, you're going to probably want to make sure and you don't have any filters based on them because we have seen that at times where, you know, an older user maybe in the past went in and set a preference that maybe they did temporarily to test something and they forgot to take that setting off. And then they're wondering why they're not receiving those notifications. So when I go to the bid activities by this company, I can actually come in here and see, hey, what, what projects are we pursuing or have we had interest in in the past? Now I can filter by, again, you know, the, the name of the company, the name of uh, the project, whatever. But I can come down through here and you'll see there's a column right here, opt out of notifications. So on a project by project basis, you can see I have some set yes or no. So you can see on this initial project, which is a test project, keep in mind, you're looking at the system from my perspective. So I have a much broader view as what some of you bidders might have. I can actually come in here and change and say, no, I don't want to uh, opt out of communications, which means I would receive whatever notices came out. Or for example, on this project where yes, I've opted out, that means I would not receive any noti notifications for this project. So where that comes in handy is let's say maybe we're looking at a large project um, and you looked at it initially thinking that you might be interested, but you've looked at it closer and you're thinking, nah, you know, I, I'm really not interested in pursuing this and I don't want to receive all the additional notifications with addenda and questions being answered and things of that nature. You can come in and simply opt out of the communications for that project. So from here, over on the right hand side, I want to skip the bids tab. We're going to cover that in just a minute. Down to the doc library. Uh, the activities is really just a calendar of um, different milestone events of different projects. I usually don't look at it. I don't know a lot of bidders look at it, but you're going to see again, mine are condensed because of so many things that I'm following because of, of my login. But the doc library, I really want to make sure that bidders are aware of some of the other resources that are right here in the system for you as well. So you can see there's a couple different folders here. I'm actually going to start at the bottom, work my way up. Some people are just looking for, hey, the vendor agreement or the account guide that just kind of walks them some of the basics of the pen bid, you know, uh, the agreement that you've signed to with using the system. So again, those documents are available there for you. The other thing that I want to point out is that we have training videos dedicated to bidders. So right here, if I come to this training videos, I can log in here. Let me just open this up quick. You can see there's actually a link. We split this into two different directions. So there's both user videos and bidder videos. So user is a public agency who's posting and managing bids. So again, for the, the consultants in the audience who might have both accounts, there's actually two different paths for those materials. The big difference is that the user videos are password protected because we only want people who are using the system in that capacity to have access to that information. But the bidder videos, they're not password protected. Anybody can go pop in there, take a look at them. And what's nice here is you're gonna see with a little showcase, we have a handful of different videos covering different aspects that you might be interested in. So how to submit a bid. Again, opting out of communications is so popular. We created a little video on that as well. So back into the system here, let's jump over to the bids tab. So the bids tab is where you can see what projects are out on the street today. So up at the top here, you see there's actually shortcuts. So you can see, hey, the bids that you've submitted, the bids that you might be following or that you know were submitted previously, but also things that were recently posted that are coming due in short time frame. Now, if I scroll down through here, again, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. So just for a sense of magnitude, PenBid has over 1,200 public agencies using PenBid to post and manage their projects. 
So for the bidders out there, not only are you gaining access to capital region projects, but a slew of other agencies worth of projects. So it's a real great central repository for public sector opportunities. So again, if you're not a member, I highly encourage you to do it. It doesn't cost anything, but you're gonna to start to expose you to a wider set of opportunities. So I can scroll down through here. I can sort by any of the categories in the columns, or I can search by keywords. So I can type in the number of the owner, the name of the project. I can look for projects that are open, closed, awarded, et cetera. There's a number of ways of filtering or sorting the data. So I wanna start with, let's just pop into a project and I have a couple of projects again, already preloaded. So let me just make sure I'm popping into the correct tab. There we go. Now, um, I was gonna pick on Capital Region and showcase one of their projects today because I know they have a couple out on the street. However, I wanted to make sure to uh, really showcase some of the unique features uh, that are being used. And um, certainly no disrespect to the projects that are on the street today, but those uh, projects at Capital Region, they're just normal projects and just using some of the normal features on there. I wanted to go into some more unique projects and show some features that you might not have encountered before. So this is one actually for the city of Lancaster. Now, when you're in a project, you're gonna encounter this set of tabs at the top here. So very methodical, the description tab will give you kind of the basics, you know, the name of the owner, the name of the project, the various dates, you know, when it was live, when it's the question cutoff period, the due date, et cetera. Down below here, we have a brief description of the project. And as we come down through, you can see, okay, of course, it's located in Lancaster County. So that gives you a great snapshot of the project. And over here on the right, there's a place for you to identify your intent to bid or not. Keep in mind, a lot of people will just kind of skip this. I highly recommend doing this because this gives the posting agency a level, you know, a gauge or a level of interest that's out there on the street. And you can also identify, you know, not only are you planning on bidding or not, but who are you? Are, are you a prime? Are you a subcontractor or a supplier or, or, or other? So again, it's always good to do that. Now, what's nice is when you take those actions, anytime you take a trackable action on a project, it will automatically add you to the potential bidders list. So the posting agency always has a clear record of who's looking at the project so that if they do issue things like addenda, you will be included as a part of those communications. And that's, uh, that's always very important. So the bid documents, if clearly you're, you're going into a project, you wanna find the, pro the documents that are available. Right here, we can come in, you can see down below here, not a whole lot of documents, but if we click on this folder, you'll see there's a couple of uh, files for you. So this is one of the things I wanted to point out. Sometimes you might have clicked on one of these little arrows to the left and it minimizes the subfolder. And sometimes it's minimized up the top here. So people will come here and they'll say, there's no documents. I, I, I don't see anything, you know, you know it, it looks like this. So always make sure to double check and see, hey, are there any subfolders where those files are located? And chances are you're gonna find them right there. What's nice is you can download documents individually. So you can come right here and choose one or multiple, download them here. Or let's say you have an example where you have a whole bunch of documents. It's quite common for some design firms to break out their plans and specs into a variety of pieces. You can actually download everything within a folder right here on the left. So I can, with one click of this button, we'll download all of the documents within that particular folder. So there's choices there based on what you're looking to obtain. Now, going to the clarifications tab. So let's say you have a question for the posting agency. Well, as we can see right here, for this particular project, we are beyond the questions period. So the little button that would normally reside over here for me to add a question is taken away. So that ensures protocols are maintained 
when it comes to you know, the agency only accepting questions up to a certain point. So what you can also see here is any questions that have been answered previously and made available to the bidders. So again, what's nice about this is you can see, hey, if I was coming in there and I had a question, but it's already been answered, I don't have to ask it again. So it's a great place to pop in, take a look, see what the agency has already answered so you're not duplicating those questions. And what is nice is you can export these. You don't have to just stay right here. I can come here to this little gear icon and I can just with a click of a button either drop these into an Excel file or into a PDF document with just a couple mouse clicks. So, if I jump over to the bidders tab, I'm gonna skip the response tab for just one second. We'll be coming back to that in just a minute. The bidders tab will show you a listing of who are all of the potential bidders that are looking at this project. So again, as a reminder, as a bidder, you'll never be able to see who has submitted a bid. That's a, a critical element of the open and fair competitive process. Again, the system was designed to minimize collusion and or coercion. So as far as you're concerned as a bidder, it's always a clean slate. You don't really know who's going to bid until after the due date has been received and the bids are actually opened by the posting agency. But what you can see, so let's say you're a supplier. Like, well, let's pretend I'm somebody from AG Industrial. Well, I'm probably going to be curious to who are the prime contractors that are looking at this project. And I would go down through and find, oh, okay, yeah, so here's a potential prime contractor. I should probably reach out to these folks to see if they want to include my stuff as a part of their bid. So from the bidder's perspective, this becomes a very useful tool to productively coordinate on you know, who you're going to be potentially teaming with as a part of submitting a bid. So from here, let's go back over to the response tab. So the response tab is where you go to actually submit your bid or provide your response, which hence the name. Now, the first thing you're going to see is right up top here, what are the mandatory elements associated with the bid submission? Now, when it says the questions and pricing, that's really referring to the bid form. Because I think everybody recognizes the bid form entails not just the pricing line items, but many times there are things like bidder certifications, bidder acknowledgements, things of that nature. So here within PenBid, you can see down here, there are tabs that correspond with each of those mandatory elements. So we're starting here in the questions. Here's where we would upload various required supporting documents. Now, anywhere you see something that is shaded pink like this, it means it's a mandatory field. So you have to upload something. You can see right there, there's a little browse button to navigate to your files. Down here are the bidder acknowledgements. So again, these are always unique to each agency. But again, all of these things require an answer. And usually the, the posting agency will pro provide some level of instructions on what they want you to do here. But it is free flow text field. So again, if you wanted to bring to their attention that you, know, you had a concern with one of these issues, you could certainly type that in. But what is really important is as soon as you start populating your answer, you'll see that shading goes away. So there are these really obvious visual clues as to what has been completed versus what has not. And once you've satisfied all of the mandatory elements within a section, this red incomplete up here would turn into a green complete. So once you've uploaded the files they've asked for, answered all the questions they've asked for, et cetera, that would show as complete. So for this particular project, let's go to the pricing items right here. And of course, I, I don't want to actually submit a bid on this. I, I don't sell equipment, so <laughs> not something I want to do. 
But down here is where we get into the pricing line items. Now, a lot of you have probably seen various uh, iterations of this. So here, again, this is an equipment purchase and they've specced out a variety of different pieces of equipment and accessories and then all kinds of goodies here. But if we pan over, so under the normal view, you're gonna see in pen bid, the only thing the bidder does is populate their unit price. So again, let's say, you know, we, we know this vehicle is gonna cost us 10 grand. That'd be a very cheap dump truck. <laughs> so we populate our price. So we can see that the mandatory element for that line Heinem has gone away. But there's some other features here, like I mentioned before, that I wanted to showcase that you might not see very frequently. So right here, if the posting agency has allowed you to opt out of an item, so let's say you don't sell these types of trucks, there's a box here that by clicking on it under the no bid column, I'm not bidding on this and it voids the pricing here. So you don't accidentally bid on something that you don't provide. Now, the other thing we'll see is I pan over here. And this is another very unique element that doesn't get used very frequently, but I like to make sure the bidders are aware of it. And, and even some of the posting agencies that are part of our meeting today is occasionally a posting agency will allow a bidder to provide an alternate item. So in this case, they've spec'd out a particular truck, but they're not necessarily married to only that truck. They're actually open to other proposals that the bidders might suggest. Now, I know there's probably some engineers as a part of the call here um, who shudder thinking of the notion of having a bidder proposing you know, alternate items on a, on a construction project. And clearly that's not an appropriate use of the feature. So again, for the bidders, you probably won't see this frequently, but when you do, by clicking on this button, it allows you as the bidder to create a new line item within the pricing field here where you can provide your own details. So you would plug in your, and again, you can see it shows that this is the alternate that I've proposed. And it would be the make model. And again, you would provide the information that they've asked for, the pricing, et cetera. So again, I wanted to make sure that everybody saw, wow, there, there's some actually pretty cool things going on here. Um, they, again, won't be used all the time. There's a ton of features. And usually the posting agency is really good at figuring out which features are appropriate based on the project needs. Now, What's also really cool here, for those of you that weren't aware, right over here on the right-hand side where the submit bid button is, that button does not even activate until all mandatory elements have been satisfied. So from an administrative completeness standpoint, you can't submit a bid that doesn't have all the things that the posting agency has specifically said need to be there. Now, once you have submitted, uh, uh, satisfied everything, that button would enable, you'd click on it, and you will get an email confirming your bid submission with a confirmation number, date and timestamp, all that stuff. What's nice is you can get back into the system at any point in time, make any revisions or even withdraw your bids if you, for whatever reason you've choose to prior to the due date and time coming. So for example, for this, we can see this project's due in five days. I have five days to make sure that that stuff is exactly what I want. And if 15 minutes before the bids come due, I realize, oh darn, I could have done better on one of these prices. I can pop back in and make those changes. Now, keep in mind, when you make a change, you must resubmit. Think about the paper process. If you've submitted a paper bid to an agency and you wanna make a change, what do you have to do? You have to go in, get your bid back, make those changes and resubmit it. So again, the electronic process is mimicking that same concept, except here it's just a matter of going in, making your change, but you still do then have to resubmit. It's very important to remember, we have had a couple instances where a bidder will fit, go, you know, pop in, make changes and forget to resubmit. And then they wonder, hey, why isn't my bid a part of the, the results here? Well, you didn't resubmit it after you made changes. 
So that's a very important piece to remember. So I think I've covered a lot of ground here. Um, I think we're right at the end of my half hour presentation point, And I did kind of want to open it up here to any questions that folks may have. And I'm not sure that I'm seeing any of the chat feature. Um, so I don't know if Rebecca, you can see any questions that have come in from anyone or not. I don't have any questions in the chat feature right now. Okay. Um, I believe people are able to unmute themselves right now. So if, if anybody has a question. Yeah, I, I'm, I welcome any questions. Uh, make them real challenging. Uh, I, I love <laughs> ones that make me think. <laughs> Nothing. Please don't tell me it was that good that I covered every possible question out there. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to get out of here because I know I have a couple of questions. <laughs> so when I'm looking at my bids. Oh, I, I do have a question here in the chat. It says, oh, excellent. can you show CRW current projects? Oh, I can. Look at that. See, I love that. So great, great question. I'm not sure to kick that in. So what I would do as a bidder, I like to filter. I would go into the number field. And what's nice is as soon as I start typing, I don't even need to finish. So all I need is a part of the keyword associated with the project owner or a project name. The system will automatically filter then. Okay, here's various capital region water projects. And you can see that uh, they've been a long time user of the system. Um, you know, and I think they've really recognized the benefits, not just to themselves, but to the bidders of doing everything electronically. It just saves a lot of time and paper and back and forth. So was there something specific that anybody wanted to see here? Rebecca, you're muted again, if you want to, if you don't mind. Yeah, trying. the next question that came through says, can you show the MWDBE notice slash policy statement? Ooh, so I'm not sure what policy statement they're referring to there, because I believe that might be directly related to capital regions, uh, capital region waters requirements. But one of the things, uh, that's a great question. I want to touch on that. So one of the services that PenBid offers to posting agencies. So again, this is a service we offer only to folks like Capital Region Water and other people who are posting and managing projects is a DBE notification uh, service. So in those instances, uh, the agency would let us know that, hey, uh, this project requires a DBE. And what PenBid will do is we will, based on the type of work, the geography, and the funding sources at play, we'll do a search for the applicable databases. So for example, if it's a UCP certification or if it's DGS or whatever funding source DBE requirements are at play, PenBid will do a current search. So if it's a brand new company that just got their certification a few days ago, we're going to capture them. And we do a minimum of three notifications to all people who align based on services being sought and the, uh, the, the geography that those companies do work in. So again, really trying to promote awareness of those projects to the DBEs so that folks like CRW are really leveraging every tool they can to get as many participants in the mix there. So again, I like to mention that. Now, sometimes this leads to another question that I'll feed off of that. Some contractors, <coughs> pardon me, especially for construction projects, the contractors are required to do their own DBE searches and notifications to show that they're pulling their team together. And a lot of them have asked us, hey, will Penn do, do that for us? And I'm, I'm sorry, we've looked at that. And unfortunately, no, we can't. Um, obviously, all of our services and, and the assistance that we provide are focused at streamlining the posting agency side. Uh, not to mention that the bidder notification and reporting requirements are a little bit deeper and a little bit heavier. 
Um, and it would be extremely time consuming for us to do. So we've chosen that there's a couple of reasons why it just doesn't make sense for us to do that for the bidders. So we do empathize with the time and energy the bidders have to put into that. Um, but that is part of your part of uh, your responsibility in you know doing the doing the work on your side and submitting your bids. I got another one that just came in. Yes, please. Um, can can uh, pen bid users creating the bid post pre bid notices as planned advertisements or awareness of a an upcoming bid prior to the actual bid. That is a great question. So yes, uh, we do have a number of entities who maybe know that, hey, we have a couple of big projects in the pipeline and we wanna let people know so that they're kind of keeping their, their schedules open a little bit to accommodate that potential work. Um, we've seen instances, uh, I'm sure a number of the bidders will recall a couple of years ago when the weather was absolutely miserable. There was so much flooding, especially in the central part of the state. Uh, bidders couldn't keep up with the work they had because it was constantly getting flooded out and delayed. And what ended up happening is bidders stopped bidding on work because they were like, we, we can't handle the work we have, let alone take on more. So for those bidders to know in advance that, hey, there's big things in the pipeline that, yeah, we want to kind of reserve some room for. Yes, posting agencies can go in here, create what we call a placeholder bid that just gives basic information. So from, you know, I'll just use as an example, let's pretend that this is actually a placeholder. So if we were to go into this, there would be no documents because chances are the documents haven't been created. So this tab isn't there or they're in process there probably would not be the ability to answer or ask questions because there's not really much to ask at this point. But what would happen is there would be an anticipated due date for, hey, you know, this is when we're expecting it to be due. And the description field would probably get into more detail, just saying, that, hey, Capital Region Water is anticipating the following projects, might have a, a rough scope of work and approximate time frame. So keep your calendars open, stay tuned for this. And what's nice is what they can do is again, the posting agency can set this up so they can start to identify, hey, by coming in here and the bidder saying, I'm planning on bidding, they can start building a tentative bidders list to ensure that they seem people are aware of it when the actual bid goes out. So yeah, great question. Uh, Rebecca and Freddie, just a clarification um, or answer to the one question on the MWDBE notice and policy. Those are currently located in the bid documents, um, in the front ends of the bid documents. So any bidders can reference them um, in division uh, zero and one. Uh, that's where the exhibits and the policy is located. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for um, uh, highlighting that, Caleb. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kayla. But again, the question there relative to the DBE policy, keep in mind that the requirements for each bid are established by each post posting agency. PenBid does not impose any specific requirements on the bid itself. So if you're working, Capital Region may have certain set of requirements, but another agency might have a very different set of requirements. So you want to really ensure that you're looking through the project documents to what all of that agency requires so that you can submit your bid accordingly. And here's another great example of, you know, yet another way of sorting and organizing the documents. And again, I think this was actually being managed by HRG, uh, Caleb, so one of your team projects, you know, this is actually, I really appreciate this type of organization because it bidders can easily find what they're looking for. Oh, I'm looking for, you know, the payment procedures. They can quickly sort through and find exactly what pieces they're looking for. Any other questions? Nothing new came in. Okay, excellent. So real quick, I do want to jump back here. So um, oops, too bad. So if you have questions as a bidder, especially at the tail end, you're submitting your bid, there's five minutes to go, you're running into an issue and you're like, oh crap, what do I do? 
reach out to us. Don't waste time. Um, email or phone number. We always have our phones manned and we have people dedicated to assisting bidders just like we do dedicated assisting the posting agencies. And one of the nice things, we've had some very uh, unique bid requirements and the bidder just, you know, maybe didn't have everything in place and they had a large file and their system was, wasn't letting them upload it at the, at the last minute. And we can help document that instance that yes, the bidder was reaching out to us in advance of the due date. And they were able to document, they have all these files in place and we can help again, solidify that yes, you got your spot in here. Now, Fortunately, we've never had an issue where a bid wasn't able to be submitted. So we're extremely proud of the fact that through, and I'm going to knock on wood right now, um, over the past 11 years of operating the system, there have been no glitches. I know it's an evil word in the, in the tech sector um, that have affected a bidder's ability to submit. It's always been user errors, which is true with most things. It's always the person on the one side that was just forgetting to click one button or another. But again, we can help you walk through those at the last minute. So again, I want to thank again, uh, Capital Region Water, all the people for participating today. Again, if you have any questions, I'm going to be around. Uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for taking your time. Thanks, today. Thank you. I guess you can, are you still sharing your screen? Right. I stopped my sharing. Okay, okay. So we are at the, uh, let's see if I can't minimize. We are at the, the bottom half of today's event. Um, I appreciate everyone's questions. Um, this portion begins the project kickoff. Um, I'll be discussing the MWDB program and the engineering team will be discussing the 2021 drinking water, uh, wastewater, and stormwater um, projects. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let me, let's see, give me one second here. Okay. I'm going to start there. Okay. Everyone see that? Yep. Yep. Good job, Jarvis. <laughs> Good job. I didn't like X out and didn't have to get admitted back in. Um, once again, my name is Jarvis Brown. I'm diversity program manager. Um, and so um, I manage all the um, MWDV activities um, that it really, you know, within Capital Region Water. Um, I'm very proud to say that our MWDV pro program really permeates all aspects of Capital Region Water. There is not a day that goes by without um, the MWDB program being discussed and um, our rate pairs and our um, focus on spending locally. Um, so, you know, that's, that goes without saying, fully supported by the board. I um, was really um, glad to um, have Andy on this morning to, um, to really reiterate um, from a board perspective, our commitment to the MWDBE program um, our MWDBE program um, can be found on our website. Our plan applies to all construction projects um, that exceed the bidding threshold. Last year it was 21,000. Um, this year is 21,300 uh, $300 as of 2021. Um, so um, when you, as Freddie pulled up on pen bid, our projects are posted there. So anything over this amount gets publicly um, put out um, for bid. These certification can also be found on our website. I know we probably got a lot of note takers in the, in the audience today, um, but these can also be found on our website. Um, these are just some of the um, certifications um, that we accept. Um, the most, most common um, PAUCP and the Department of General Services, um, um, we have access to those to be able to um, search for MWDBEs um, during our project. The others, um, not so familiar with as far as searching, but they are accessible. And I've had experience with um, really just sending the email a phone call and I've been able to get the answers that I need um, to verify whether someone is in fact um, has a diverse certification or certified as an MWDBE. So, 
I wanted to begin the day um, probably working a little bit backwards, um, starting off with some frequently asked questions. We have a lot of diverse perspectives um, on the line today um, from engineers, consultants, um, constructions, um, shout out to Jai Dan Cleaning, um, very much a different perspective on what it means to, to do um, cleaning work, cleaning up construction. Um, so I wanted to just um, work backwards, answer some questions, and then I'll continue on with the presentation. Um, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, does materials count towards MWDBE participation? And the answer to that is yes. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and pull that up um, on the internet in the plan so you can see where that's specifically located. I know it's located on page eight, but I have it highlighted. And, um, and so let's see here. About that, it worked. Um, so it's page eight right here. It's bidders are advised, and I highlighted it. Um, business that provide work, including equipment and materials that will be used on a project. Um, I'm not going to read verbatim, but I did find it important to just sort of highlight. Um, it's not up. It's not. Up. Oh. Oh. oh, okay, thank you. New share. So I just learned something new. Every time you go to a new thing, you have to hit new share. Can everyone see that now? You see that? All right, great. So this is um, our MWDB plan. Um, I just highlighted the portion that um, sp specifies that equipment and materials um, are can be counted towards MWDB um, participation. Um, I'm going to go back to this and so hopefully let's go to new share let's go back to the okay um and so that's why um when i get asked that question is this very important that um folks definitely read through the mwd dbe plan because most likely the answers um to your questions can be found there but I understand that it is a it is a pretty big document, and so sometimes those things get missed, and everyone is not so familiar um, with our plan. Um, the second question I get asked a lot is, um, "I'm an MWDBE prime bidder, and does that count?" And the answer to that is yes. Um, we have had um, companies that um, are women-owned um, or minority-owned, and they are also uh, bidding prime, and they wanted to know. Hey, if you know I'm doing this, is this does this still count? And the answer to that is yes. But I also want to, I don't want to go back to a different screen. So I will tell you that can also be found on page eight of our um, MWDBE plan. And it also goes on to also state that we also, even if you are bidding prime as an MWDBE, we still encourage participation on the project. So it doesn't alleviate the response. Of, um, we we still encourage it. So if you're MWDBE, that would give 100% participation on the project. However, we don't say, well, that's good enough. We still encourage additional participation on the project. Will you accept MWD certification from out of state? Um, we, I've run into this a couple of times. And the answer to that is yes, if I can verify that you are certified as you say that you are certified. So I'm not going to give a blanket and say, hey, yes, you're from out of state and you're saying that you're MWDBE in the counts. That's not the experience. Um, I recently had a situation where they were from New York. They were a women-owned company. I was able to go into New York system and verify that they were in fact a certified WBE. That is how they're, um, that's, that would give them the reciprocity. Um, not necessarily just saying that you are um, certified would be sufficient. And I've had that experience also with a company out of New Jersey, being able to go and certify that you are MWDBE, um, you know, is important. And that really speaks to the policy because um, Capital Region Water stands by its policy. And so just because you're from out of state doesn't mean that you don't count. It just means that we just would like to be able to verify that you have that certification. So you're still able to participate and get the participation as if you were right next door. One of the other questions, and this is, 
um, the one where I knew I was going to smile at because there's some prime bidders on the line. I've had many experiences. Can you provide me with a list? I can't find anyone. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you uh, how many times I've I've heard that there's no one out there. I can't find anyone. And so I'm just going to put it here and it's being recorded that no, I cannot provide you with the list. CRW does not endorse any particular MWDBE. However, my role is as a as in as a diversity program manager is is to work with is to work with you. So while I won't provide you a list basically doing all the legwork, I will act as a li liaison between the MWDBE and the prime contractor. I know well in advance that um, these projects are coming up. Um, I've had experience with working with individuals. I have a pretty good idea of the type of work that could possibly be subbed out on these. And so when I'm asked for assistance, the first part is this, if you were looking, if you were having um, trouble, um, some difficulty finding participation on your project, one of the best things that you can do other than emailing me, and I've done this before, is I'm gonna direct you back to PenBid to make your question available for all to see um, when we have a um, project out for bid. That way, when I answer that question, there's other people that may be thinking the same thing or having difficulty. So if I'm able, I will post, that will be posted at, that'll be a clarification and that can be answered um, via PenBid. Um, there's also times where um, I have access and I'm communicating with MWDBEs and I've let them know what projects are there and how they can, they can best um, advocate for themselves to be on the project. But as far as providing a, a, a list, um, um, the answer to that is no, we don't endorse any lists um, or you know, stand behind anyone um, that's performing that type of work. So with that being said, I'm gonna go out on a limb here once again and attempt to do a search um, just so you can, and it is a very generic search, um, but it is, it will be useful um, to those that may be searching um, for MWDBE. So I'm going to go to the PAUCP website here. If you can't see that, just shake your head and I'll go and I may have to hit that screen. Can you see that, Fred, anyone? Okay, so I'm going to go to new share and you should be able to see it now. Okay, this is a PAUC website. This is one of the certifications that we do accept. Um, so under vendor, vendor certification, um, search for certified firms, and it says search our database of DBE and ACDBE certified vendors. I would just click on search on the search option. Um, under certifications, I unclick this. I do because I, I'm not familiar with that, but I do know that's one of the certifications, but that's not particularly what I'm looking for. Um, business name, business description. So that's where you can give a description of the work. So you can say construction, you can say something like that and it should pull something up. Search by the person if you already know their names and then search by location. So when we have individuals who um, businesses on the line, you know, says, hey, I can't find anyone or I'm having trouble. Um, I will admit PAUCP is probably one of the most user-friendly. The Department of General Services website is not. <laughs> and so many people have trouble searching through the DGS um, so, but this is PAUCP. So let me go out on a limb here. As you can see, I have some people already in here. So I cheated a little bit, but um, so let's go to try electric and go down to state. I'm gonna go to PA. All right. And I'm not a robot. I hate these. So let me, do this. I hope I don't. This is, I'm taking a test in front of everyone here. Um, let's see. I wonder if the bottom counts. All right. So now I can search. And as we see, Trial Electric pops up. You can see that he is a certified DBE. 
Um, and if you click on that, it'll give you all the information. Trial Electric is actually a, um, a MBE um, electrical company. We actually have them on a project right now. Um, I've had an opportunity to talk with Mel Tra, very good guy, um, and, and I've been happy to work with him. Um, and so here's all the business information. So here's a freebie, anyone looking for electrical, uh, electrical work in the area, Mel Tra is definitely um, available here. So you can see that he is certified. And I'm just going to close this window. So that's how you search on the PAUCP. Um, there's a different way you can search. So it, like I said, if you don't know an exact name, you can search by electrical. Um, I'm not like um, Freddie with PennBid <laughs> with PAUCP, but I can tell you I know how to search and I know how to pull up someone's certification. And we'll get into why I'm having certification numbers and finding out who your MWDB is certified with is important. You'll understand that later on in the presentation. So I'm going to go. I'm also going to pull the DGS website up here. And you should be able to see this, this DGS website also. Um, they have, it automatically populates with some businesses. See if I can scroll down here. Um, I don't much about these. I haven't necess necessarily searched for these. I just know when I come to the screen, this is what pops up. Um, but I'm gonna search, do a search here. All right, so if you know the name or this SAP number here, that makes it a lot easier. I know Gem Group to be um, um, a company. Um, and so they are uh, small diverse business, small business. Here's when they're, this is their validity dates here, their address and all their information. If I click on Gem Group here, um, I've, uh, Gem Group has been on our project before. And so I know that there are MWDBE, um, women-owned business right here, their classification. So all their information is right here. So this is another freebie. Um, some of their certification codes and things like that. So for a more in-depth search, you can go into DGS and play around with it. But I thought for um, you know, for just instructional purposes, I would go through and just pull up a couple businesses on each of those websites. The DGS is, if I hadn't known Gem Group, it can be, um, it's not as user friendly as the PAUCP, and it does take a little bit of working around with, um, but any end, it'll be worth it. So with some of those frequently asked questions, we also have some common mistakes that I come that I come uh, that I come across um, when I'm doing bid evaluations. Um, I was glad um, Freddie was able to go into the Capital Region Water Projects and be able to show that um, our MWDB plan is right in there with the rest of the bid documents. And my goal for today um, was to highlight the fact that if you're submitting a bid without any MWDBE documentation that your package is it is incomplete there's there's this um i've come across instances where the exhibit one is not submitted with the bid as if they are separate and they'll say i didn't see it and 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 i didn't know that it was there but it's a part of the package it's just is um really something that you just have to read through the documentation and it's in there and so there's no separation that the the mwdbe program um, documentation is a part of your bid package. So if you send it without it, then it's incomplete. Um, no commitments on the exhibit ones. Um, and I have a sample exhibit one after this, so I'll be able to show you exactly um, what I'm talking about. And no commitment means is that 
on the exhibit one that's required because that's what gets submitted. Um, that means that there was no commitments to any MWDBEs. So there's no way to evaluate for participation because there's no commitments. Um, mass solicitations. I'm going to get into mass solicitations just a little bit uh, later and I guess more for corrective purchases. But a common mistake I see with mass solicitations is that you send out so many solicitations that you're not, that you haven't, they may have not have been updated or you pull them from somewhere else and you find that the people that you submitted, uh, that you solicited to were not of quality. Um, an example that I can give you is that um, I checked through mass solicitations because I actually got like 50 solicitations all at one time. And I actually went through them all. And one was from California. There would be no way, you couldn't reasonably expect an MWDBE to provide a quote and participate from California in a job that you have here in Pennsylvania. And so that is one of the common mistakes I make when I'm trying to solicit for solicitation um, uh, for participation is doing mass solicitation. Um, solicitation efforts are not timely. Um, the exhibit one gives a space for individuals to be able to um, correctly document when your solicitations went out. And I've run into instances where now the problem that the bidder is having um, is now something that I'm working through because they didn't um, use their time to solicit for participation um, in a timely manner. And here we are within five days or less of the bid and we're um, just now soliciting for participation. And it definitely shows in the documentation. And lastly, no supporting documentation. The plan is very clear um, about what documentation is needed if the percentage, if the participation goals are not met. And so what will happen is it's not only well, the exhibit one may not get submitted. There's also the situation where the exhibit one is submitted, but there's no supporting documentation um, to back that up. And so what I have here is a sample exhibit one for confidential purposes. I um, blacked out all the information that identifiable information, but I wanna draw your attention to this middle so section here. Um, three through seven. Um, one of the first things that you can see that I see when I get this, because when the bids come in, I get all the MWDBE participation, is that it says certification program and number. Well, these numbers could mean anything. I have no way of knowing who they're certified through. Um, and so if I'm to verify that these solicitations are of quality, it is important to put down who the certifying agency is. That way I can have some sense of what these numbers mean because that is a part of the bid evaluations and making sure that we have quality solicitations here and that the individuals that you picked are in fact certified MWDBEs. Um, the dates of solicitations I, uh, I blacked out, um, but I can tell you that along with no program that this particular exhibit was pretty consistent with not being um, responsive. Um, total dollar amount of quote received, no information given. So not only um, is there no quotes, we also see here that there are no commitments. And so this exhibit highlights all of the common mistakes that I spoke about on a previous slide. Um, so um, just be mindful of these um, if you submit this, and this is the exhibit one, this is what gets filled out um, to highlight your commitments to the MWDBEs. This is the form that is used um, for the bid evaluation information that you put here. So it is very important to fill this out correctly and make sure that you review the MWDBE plan so that um, you, submit, um, you submit it appropriately. But with that being said, it's important to also um, be able to highlight how you can um, have um, you this how we can correct this. And one of those is just the, really the intent, the good faith effort is really the intent of the bidder, that the bidder takes all reasonable and necessary steps to reach the participation goal. And so what that means is, is that um, all available means of solicitation. So that means fax, phone, email, 
Um, even going so far as to attend the pre-bid meeting. We know that the pre-bid meetings aren't mandatory. However, that's a great way to get um, participation on the project is show up to the pre-bid meeting. Um, and you, you, know, you may have some luck there and that's a great way to ask questions during that pre-bid meeting. I attend the pre-bid meeting. So all available means of solicitation. I have had instances where um, someone only solicited through fax. And my joke was, that's where we get the timeshare information. Who uses fax as a primary means of communication? You know, you know, our vacation packages to Orlando come through the fax. So, you know, I couldn't reasonably take that with any degree of seriousness that you really wanted um, any, you really wanted to meet a participation goal by sending out 50 faxes. Um, <laughs> The other part are quality solicitation. Um, are the MWDBEs that you solicited, are they certified? And a step further, are they solicit certified to do the work that you're soliciting for? To have an MWD per participation is one thing, but they should also be able to do the work that you're asking. So for example, we don't want to exchange an MWDBE traffic control company for electrical. You need to be able to have, um, have them certified to do the work that you are soliciting for. Um, are the businesses within a reasonable distance? Um, going back to my example in California, you don't wanna to solicit to MWDBEs who have no reasonable chance of participating in the project due to distance. I, you know, when I evaluate those bids, those are the type of things that I'm looking for. Um, quality solicitations. Um, and this is my other warning. This goes back to my warning about mass solicitation. I've gotten bids where someone has sent, you know, 50 or so solicitations. And I can tell you that I'm going through all of them um, because I'm not sure that's always necessary. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just cautioning against sending out mass solicitations without being able to verify for yourself that they're quality. And the last one is bitter motivations all um, bidder motivations. So prime bidders and, 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 and folks that are going to be um, meeting the participation goals is not just filling out the form to fill out the form. And that can be really seen in some of the exhibits that I get, um, sort of not having a passive, passive really passive approach to um, participation. Um, also timeliness of your solicitations, given the MWDBEs, um, a reasonable amount of time to be able to come up with the scope, review the work and come up with a quote. Um, I don't think giving, you know, sending information out, um, attempting solicit three days or four days before um, a bid is, um, is reasonable. Um, and so providing um, a reasonable amount of time to get a response. Um, and so all those things constitute um, what goes into having um, a good faith effort, reasonable and necessary steps by the bidder to meet the percentage goal. Here, I just did sort of a mock um, exhibit one filled out um, of, of what it could possibly look out, you know, made up some fake companies. There will be more solicit date, solicitation dates. Um, Fred just said for PEMBID, they sent out at least three so on different dates and they send us no, those reports. So I realistically, I wouldn't expect anything less from a prime bidder that you attempted, you know, all available means of solicitations on multiple dates. Um, and also um, just highlighting the certification um, program and number helps to be able to identify that the um, company is certified to do the work. And I just sort of made this up total dollar amount of quote received and total commitment dollar. So from this on its surface, I would be able to say, hey, they, they filled it out. They have um, participation on their project and um, they have also made some commitment. It wouldn't stop there. This is just one part. If you haven't met the percentage goals, I'm also looking for some um, supporting documentation that our plan highlights. So filling out the exhibit one correctly is one, making sure that you have met the requirements of the MWDB plan by submitting additional documentation is something else. And that just requires a little bit of um, a reading 
and maybe reaching out to me if there's something that you don't understand. And lastly, um, I provided some resources for the PAUCP and the Department of General Service for those that, that may are not familiar with those platforms. So these links will take you to their help guides. Um, I've had to use them. Um, like I said, especially the DGS is not user friendly, um, but they, they should be helpful um, in um, navigating those platforms. Um, and that's all I have. The engineering team um, will be up next and then there will be um, a chance for Q&A after um, their presentations also. So I appreciate your time and, um, and sit tight. We, have, uh, we are within our last 45 minutes. Uh, so thank you. All right, Jarvis, you just want me to start presenting on the capital projects? Go Anything for it. Before that? Go, go for it, Jeff. Okay, I'm, I've been waiting. <laughs> Ready. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. All right. You should be seeing our Capital Region Water website. Okay. Good. Well, again, thanks everyone for your participation today. Uh, my name is Jeff Boray, uh, lead engineer with Capital Region Water. I've been here seven years now, um, working with Dave Stewart, our director of engineering and, and Claire Mulhart. Um, I have a number of responsibilities, but primarily responsible for development and execution of the drinking water and wastewater capital projects. And then, I'm going to go through those projects and then Claire's going to um, cover the stormwater GSI and wet weather projects. So what I'd like to do is go over, uh, provide a general overview of the capital projects, uh, you know, on a high level, not in detail, just because the number of projects that we have uh, going. I'm going to provide a description of work. Uh, the estimated schedule and uh, the approximate construction values. And uh, when we have those, we do try to, to post those on PenBid as well. So as Jarvis mentioned, we, you know, we put out a lot of construction contracts to bid uh, on PenBid, and we're looking for overall participation at the time of bid submission on that exhibit one. But I also wanted to remind contractors and prime contractors and subcontractors that when change orders come up during construction, as they seem to always do, those goals outlined in the plan still apply and are reviewed by CRW staff and the CRW board. Um, each change order for a construction project must be approved by the CRW board. And a recent change uh, that I just want to make everyone aware of is we are now requiring that the exhibit one form be submitted by the contractor as part of every change order package. So we do want to see any participation for additional work or if not we, we want to clearly understand why that's the case. So then we look at that and also compare that to the impact to the overall participation on a project level. So as I go through these projects here, uh, several are funded by the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Investment Authority, also known as PennVest. So they provide low interest loans for drinking water, wastewater water, and stormwater projects throughout Pennsylvania. I want to mention that because they have their own MWDBE requirements. If you're familiar with them, they have the six good faith efforts. So that is a separate but similar process and forms that are required as part of the bid submission. But those are required by Capital Region Water for us to receive funding. So you'll see with each project, if PenVest applies, that solicitation guidance 
and the forms will be included in the project manual and required at the time of bid submission. So Jarvis touched on this, but I would strongly encourage uh, prime subcontractors to, to attend the pre-bid meetings. As he said, um, I'm in attendance, Jarvis attends those as well as our design engineer. Uh, for now, those are virtual meetings, but typically those are, those are held in person. But that's, that's where today I'm just gonna touch on each project for five minutes or so. But I, I can't say it strongly enough, attend those meetings that's where we really spend you know an hour talking about the specifics of the project of the work uh, where opportunities are for participation uh, we'll discuss penvest if that's applicable answer questions uh, we do circulate sign-in sheets and issue uh, uh, the pre-bid meeting minutes and that has the sign-in contact information and that's circulated as an addendum on PenBid, so there's, you know, that contact information is is provided for additional networking opportunities. Um, each each attendee, excuse me, is designated uh, with their classification, MW or DBE. So, just want to cover where are the opportunities for participation. We're not just talking about construction contracts. I knew I know we do have some consulting engineers on the line here today. So thanks everyone for joining from both sides. Um, but as far as the engineering goes, we work with a number of retained engineers. That work includes study, design, and construction phase services. So although it's not explicit, we do ask for the same commitment as far as percentage and type of participation that is included in the plan for professional services. So that can include anything from what we've seen on past projects. This is just a, a partial list, but survey, environmental studies, wetland delineation, permitting, traffic control, CCTV pipe inspections, subsurface utility engineering or SUE work, geotechnical borings, RPR inspection, scheduling services, soils testing, concrete testing, et cetera. So that's, again, just a, not to be meant to be a complete list, but those are some opportunities. And again, that does depend on the type and the nature of the project. As far as construction contracts, so from the contractor side, you know, some of the obvious opportunities are pre-construction video or photograph documentation, traffic control, signage and flagging, paving, trucking, demolition, CCTV inspection, cured in place pipelining, bypass pumping, and material suppliers. So that's just to list a few there. So now that I kind of covered that general information, I would like to go through our 2021 projects. Um, unless otherwise noted, they will be a single contract, but again, re refer to the advertisement that will be on PenBid and it will list out the, the number and type of contracts. So I'd like to, to run through each one. I'd like to hold questions until the end. And what, what I'll do is make sure that Jarvis is able to provide my contact information to everyone that registered today. So if there are questions on specific projects, uh, you can contact me directly and follow up with uh, specific questions offline. So what we're looking at is, have on the screen here is Capital Region Water's website. Um, so for anyone that's interested in our in our projects, um, just go to the home page and then at the top here, click on the projects tab. Right at the top, you'll see capital improvement projects. Click on that again. Find the map here and just click on it one more time. So what that does is bring up a page dedicated to 
the annual capital improvements projects. So what's up obviously is the 2021 projects as each annual budget is developed, this web page will be updated. So again, you can look through everything that's here. And in 2022, we would update everything with, with the new projects. So I wanna thank our entire engineering department at Capital Region Water, especially our GIS team who developed this for us. Uh, this is an improvement. As far as what's a, what information is available to engineers and contractors. Uh, this provides a, a great way to look at all the projects or just very specific projects that you might be interested in bidding on. So we're gonna click through each of these here. You can see on the bottom left, just for your reference, it's broken out by drinking water, tabs two through nine, storm water, which Claire is gonna cover, uh, wastewater, which I will cover here, and then Claire is gonna cover the combined sewer system priority planning areas. So without further ado, um, as you click through the numbers on the top, it will take you to the specific project and have a pop-up window appear. So what the first one we have here is the Dehart Dam Spillway Improvements. It will, it's currently in design, will be advertised this year the general scope is to increase spillway capacity to safely pass the probable maximum flood as defined by Pennsylvania DEP. Uh, we're generally going to replace the, the upper portion of the spillway chute and modify the spillway opening to increase the length. And there's a number of other associated improvements, including bridge re replacement, Right now, the estimated construction cost is $20 million. Um, and that's gonna be a multi-year construction project. So as we have updated information, you can access this website and um, find, that, find those updates. I did wanna point out that as you scroll through each of the projects along the top and click on them, each one does have a project fact sheet that is hyperlinked in blue letters here. So these were primarily developed when you click on them for uh, budget preparation, but it does contain very good information on the background project purpose, the summary of the work and estimated project timeline. So the information as far as schedule and cost on here can change. So again, if you have questions on anything, just, just give me a call as these were developed at this point in, in the fall of 2020. So things do change as we progress through project design. So I'm gonna keep moving here. The mountain line clearing project, phase two, that is clearing of 11 miles of, of raw water mountain line for CRW access, but that project uh, will be, a, is going to the CRW board this month for, for award. So. The, bid, the bidding is closed for this project, but just wanted to mention it because it is on the, on the website here. Same thing with mountain line repairs. Uh, this is minor repair along our raw water mountain line, but this work is already under contract. Keep moving here to the 2021 water system improvements project. I believe Freddie showed that this is active and being advertised on PennBid now. The pre-bid meeting is scheduled for Monday, January 25th. So if this is new to you and not on your radar and you're interested, please be sure to go on PennBid and uh, request attendance at that. We'll be awarding the contract at the February board meeting. And the scope generally includes three project locations, almost 9,000 feet of six inch water main almost 300 service replacements, 22 hydrants, and the estimated cost is $2.5 million in construction. It will be constructed uh, this calendar year. So as you can see on the screen, uh, the first site is North 6th Street at Hamilton and Harris. So if, you, and when you're in this map here, it's kind of nice, you can zoom in and out. So these, this first location is 
directly adjacent to the new federal courthouse building and the proposed Pennsylvania State Archives building. The second location is 12th Street, just off Cameron Street here uh, by Goodwill Drive. And just south of State Street here, uh, this entire North Allison Hill area that's, that's outlined uh, will be replaced with new water main. Moving on to the Cameron Street Water Main Improvements Phase 3. Uh, the plan is to advertise this project in April. The scope includes replacement of roughly 3,700 feet of 20 inch water main and 1,300 feet of six through six and 16 inch, excuse me, water main in Cameron Street. And as, as you can see on the screen, that's from Chinoy Street south to the Harrisburg City line. That work is in the middle of Cameron Street, a state road, uh, but will include a replacement of associated valves, hydrants, and water services. Uh, the, the intent there is to install a parallel replacement, so temporary water is not anticipated at this time. Uh, one project that you'll see three different times here, just under the drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater, uh, designation is the I-83 project. That is part of PennDOT's I-83 Capital Beltway project. Um, that has their own website, so i-83beltway.com if you'd like inf more information on that. And what's shown on our map is the Section 3 project here. So, so I encourage you to go there if, if you're looking for details on that project. But going back to the CRW map here, really this, this work is we're working with PennDOT's engineers uh, to design uh, adjustments to our utilities that will result from the expansion of the interstate there. So that is a the limits of the project that you're looking at here. That's gonna be a 10 year project broken into three different contracts, but that will be, advertised and constructed under pen bids control. So this project will not be advertised by Capital Region Water. Uh, one additional drinking water project that is not shown is a soda ash feed replacement project. This will be advertised uh, within a week or so on pen bid, so keep an eye out for that. It's located at our water treatment facility at 100 Pine Drive and it is for uh, conversion from a dry soda ash delivery system to a mechanical discharge and feed system. So that's going to include demolition of old equipment and installation of a new soda ash feed system. The estimated construction cost on that is, is $500,000 and will be constructed this calendar year. That gets us to the end of the drinking water projects. So I'm gonna jump to wastewater. As highlighted on the screen here, um, very large and a critical project for us, the Front Street Interceptor Rehabilitation Phase 2 project. This will be funded by PennBest. Um, it is currently in design and will be advertised this summer. And the project includes rehab rehabilitation of our uh, one of our primary interceptors, the Front Street Interceptor. It includes 14,000 feet of existing cast in place concrete rectangular interceptor sewer. So the proposed rehabilitation method is cured in place pipelining. And just keep in mind when, when this comes out, this is not a circular pipe. So it's gonna be a specialty um, installation and bypass pumping is required. But as you can see that this goes from Seneca Street all the way down to the I-83 bridge here where our, it ties into our Front Street pumping station. Um, that is going to be going to construction later this year and continue through 2022. Next is the 2021 sewer system improvements project. So if you're familiar with Capital Region Water, we typically um, issue and, and complete a sewer system improvements project once per year. 
this, this year's project will be a little bit different. It will be funded by PennVest, but again, part of our annual rehab and renewal program. Uh, this project, instead of being bid and completed this year, will be a two-year project. So we're going to advertise this spring. Um, we're going to will include several locations. Uh, we're looking at over 10,000 feet uh, combination of cured in place pipelining and replacement. And with these projects, uh, we typically replace the associated um, stormwater inlets, pipes, and manholes. The current construction cost estimate for this is $7.7 .7 million. So if you click on the project fact sheet, that is um, different from what you'll see there but the current estimate is 7.7. .7. And again, we would look to begin construction later this year and continue the same contract through the end of 2022. So as mentioned, there are several locations. 15th Street here is one. State Street from roughly 13th to 20th and then Mulberry Street right, right um, near the intersection of Mulberry, Mulberry and Derry there. I'll just cover this because it's on the project here, but the Front Street Pumping Station improvements, that project is already un under construction and will be completed this spring. Same with the AWTF primary digester rehabilitation that is uh, nearing the end of construction and will be completed this spring. But moving on to another one that will be advertised uh, coming up here is the AWTF Energy Recovery Improvements Project. This will be funded by PennVest as well. And this one will have four contracts. So we'll have a general contract, electrical, HVAC, and plumbing contract. The plan tentatively is to advertise this summer with construction occurring later this year uh, through 2022. Generally, the project will make process improvements to condition digester gas, retire the existing engineers that are there and provide backup power generation for the, the wastewater treatment facility. It will include enhanced thickening of waste activated sludge or WAS, alkaline thermal hydrolysis, biogas compression and conditioning to pipeline quality, um, we're going to be constructing, receiving, and equal, equalization facilities for high strength waste, um, also known as a trucked in waste receiving station there. Project will include all associated facilities, site and yard piping, architectural services, structural, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, and instrumentation and controls. So we will have uh, three new buildings there and quite a lot of pipe work associated with that project. So the Construction cost estimate for this with all four contracts combined is currently at $14 million. So another sizable project for us. Moving right along, Arsenal Boulevard sewer system improvements. This is located at the intersection of 17th Street and Arsenal Boulevard or the Route 22 bypass and you can see here this is right near our water treatment facility at 100 Pine Drive. The project will be funded by PennVest and include rehab and replacement of roughly 3,500 feet of sewer pipe. This will include a number of different technologies, including, as I mentioned, new pipe installation or traditional dig and replace, micro tunneling installation, cured in place pipelining, pipe bursting, and associated stream bank stabilization work. The estimated construction cost for this project is $3 million and will be advertised actually next week on PennVid. So another one to keep your eye out for with construction uh, occurring later this year into 2022. So that gets me to the end of the drinking water and wastewater projects that are listed on the website but there was one other I did want to mention. It's not shown just because of the nature of the project is our 2021 street restoration project. 
Again, if you've been following CRW, we've been putting out these contracts once a year. Uh, this one will be advertised in the spring and constructed in 2021 with work complete by November. Uh, the scope includes restoration of approximately 50 to 100 street cuts made by CRW field maintenance staff within the city of Harrisburg. Uh, that includes city street restorations as well as PennDOT restorations. Those vary in size from as small as four by six to 10 by 10 or larger, just depending on uh, the work that was required there. And the estimated construction cost for that is half a million dollars. So I know that was a lot, um, but I wanted to make sure I just touched on everything. As you can see, just those projects that I've, I've briefly covered um, is over $16 million in wastewater work, $8 million in drinking water work. When, when I mentioned those totals, those are 2021 totals. Um, the totals that are listed for each project can extend into out years, as I said, if they're a multi-year construction. But again, and you can see we have a lot of work, so we're looking for great contractors, great participation moving forward. Um, so as a reminder, when you click on each of these projects, if you like, look at those project fact sheets. And if you have any questions, like I said, we'll, I'll make my contact information available. I'll make sure Jarvis can send that out to everybody. And that wraps up my portion. I wanna make sure I pass it off to Claire and give her some time to talk about her projects. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm trying, it looks like, uh, Rebecca, I need um, to be allowed to host to share my screen. That's right, let me, uh, let me help you here. And, and I'll, yeah, I'll just start getting uh, to talking here. Um, and I'll, I'll be pretty brief as well, but I, uh, you know, encourage you if you, if um, the scopes of work that I talk about are in line with the services you provide, please reach out to me directly and I can go into more detail with everything. Um, what I'm gonna touch on initially uh, will be, um, you know, some of our, our, we're still working on some long-term, uh, you know, planning strategy for, uh, the stormwater work, uh, and uh, there's uh, a lot of work to come. So can everyone see my screen now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so just to, to touch on, um, so I'm Claire Malhart. I'm the City Beautiful H2O Program Manager, which is, uh, we've branded our long-term uh, integrated uh, wet weather control plan slash, you know, it does incorporate a lot of the work that Jeff has, has already talked about. Um, and working to uh, towards uh, compliance, which is many, many years out, um, but finding those, those most cost-effective projects uh, to uh, get our, our stormwater, our combined sewer system um, into compliance. Uh, so with that, I'm actually gonna start kind of at the, the tail end of the, the project list here, um, which is 26, 27, and 28, which are our, our priority planning areas for uh, looking for um, uh, wet weather control, stormwater controls uh, to implement uh, long term, um, and and then we have some short term, uh, you know, short term goals uh, within that that we're we're actually actively looking at packaging up some you know project you know early action uh, green infrastructure projects um, in uh, in under uh, so PenVest funds that we've secured. Um, there will be you know, two future packages, um, a, a uh, mid-2022 uh, $4.7 million construction package that will get under design here in the next couple of months, and then a, um, a uh, another $4 million package of green infrastructure projects you know, across these three planning areas uh, um, in the 2023 timeframe. And we have, uh, we have until 2025 to, to get all of those those projects constructed under those phases. Uh, so um, I think that kind of touches touches on the, the that planning here. That you know the scope of this work is uh, mostly focused in on green stormwater infrastructure. Um, we're looking how uh, that these projects can overlap though with some inline storage, so upsizing pipes. So there will be um, you know stormwater infrastructure um, uh, pipe work as part of that. Um, all of the this work moving forward. 
Um, and again, so in the interest of time, I'm going to touch on the the two the two projects um, that um, will be going to to bid this year. And we have uh, the there's the um, Bellevue Park uh, stormwater ponds retrofit project. This the scope of this work um, includes. Uh, retrofitting these existing ponds uh, so that they can help us manage um, stormwater. So it'll be um, uh, grading throughout this, um, upgrades to uh, the, uh, the structures, uh, the weir systems, um, and um, outfall pipes, connector pipes, and, and you know, sediment control uh, within this. And then major restoration planting um, we are looking at uh, approximately uh, a one point uh, like two five uh, construction budget here, um, and this is going to be help us manage um, a significant drainage area uh, that's coming um, up, uh, you know, down from Reservoir Park um, through down Market Street and, and parts of the, the neighborhood all draining to these ponds, uh, and we we hope to uh, anticipated. Um, bidding this uh, late summer for you know, around a, a, a fall um, award and start of construction. This is the second project that we hope that it's actually ready to bid, um, but we, we need to work, hopefully work through some uh, property owner coordination um, is the Camp Curtin YMCA green infrastructure. Uh, this includes um, uh, green infrastructure components along the periphery, along 6th Street, Forrester, um, and woodbine, uh, tree plantings, um, stormwater infiltration beds, uh, stormwater bulb outs, and then a large, um, under the, the back field here, a large infiltration bed um, and storage bed uh, to, to manage runoff, um, not only from the site, but from uh, the uh, adjacent right of ways. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we're looking to, uh, Again, oh, and there's also um, uh, a really uh, innovative and um, new feature. There will be a what's called a stormwater wall and green walls along the face of the buildings uh, to also help manage uh, stormwater. Uh, so there's a lot of complex components here. Um, pretty cool project. Hopefully, we can get a, uh, get moving forward. This has an uh, estimated uh, uh, construction cost of about 1.8 million. Um, and again, on the same time frame, uh, looking to, to bid in the same time frame as the Bellevue Park project. These, both of these projects are also in under our PENVEST funding and will um, have to meet those requirements. Uh, just to touch on quickly, we, and we have two projects that are currently under construction, uh, Fourth and Dolphin uh, here that has new basketball courts, uh, stormwater um, swales uh, and um, all uh, the basketball court and a, and a, a reduced parking lot that's all porous pavement, new circulation and play equipment in partnership with the city. Uh, and then the other project we have under construction is the Dairy Street uh, Green Infrastructure Project. There's uh, several uh, uh, stormwater surface features that are um, sort of surface expressions of stormwater. Um, but then there's also extensive underground infiltration beds tied to stormwater tree trenches um, and the, the float food planters that are part of this work. This extends from 4th, 14th Street to 15th Street um, along Derry. And uh, both of those projects, we, uh, we are looking at a spring completion. Uh, the, um, I think the, the other project to touch on here um, which a portion of this this could get included into that package of, of projects I was uh, uh, initially talking about there, the design package for um, that $4.7 million uh, package uh, for, uh, to be constructed in 2020, start construction in 2022. Um, this would, um, this is currently, the, the portion shown is being led by the city and we're evaluating um, whether infra green infrastructure can be um, uh, included in this project, but there's also uh, uh, additional projects that that, is, uh, that are coming out of that planning work um, that are adjacent to, to this site um, and maybe you know implemented with uh, CRW in that CRW led effort. 
Uh, and then the last thing I'll touch on is the um, back on the pen dot mark here. Sorry, that's 16. Um, uh, similar to what Jeff mentioned, there are you know stormwater uh, relocation abandonment, but um, on the stormwater side, there's a more significant effort going on in partnership uh, with uh, with PennDOT. All this work would still be under their their lead, but we're putting in a large um, stormwater uh, diversion pipe uh, with eventually a new outfall uh, to Paxton Creek. Um, as part of trying to, to separate a large portion of that um, lower Paxton Creek uh, sewer shed. Um, and so there will, there will mo most likely be, I just note this um, in the future, not, not, not currently in 2021, but, but CRW led um, small sewer separation uh, projects as part of this work around uh, the, the storm diversion pipe, um, large uh, detention systems that um, may be connected to this diversion pipe. So stay tuned for um, the different strategies that will be um, evaluated and, and possibly implemented in the next you know, uh, few years. So, or well, probably in the long, long term uh, project schedule, 10 to, 10 to 12 years. So. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, again, I'm um, you know, available to, to talk with anyone that's on the phone, uh, shoot me an email if you have any further questions. There's a lot of detail here. Um, each of those projects I just touched on uh, have um, the project batch, back sheets, backs, back sheets that, that uh, Jeff had already mentioned. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll leave some time here for for questions. Excellent. As of right now, I don't have any in the chat feature. Um, I'll give it a few more minutes if you'd like. And um, Here's a question. What is coming up for design projects? Yeah, so back on, um, you know, coming out of this, uh, this planning effort, uh, we have, um, uh, we're working, we're probably like two thirds of the way through uh, this planning effort and a portion that there's early action projects that are coming out of that or those, those PENVAS packages I was talking about, but there will be um, uh, um, most likely other packages of projects coming out of a longer term strategy um, that um, will culminate the, these, this planning effort and get rolled into um, an update uh, to our, our city beauty glacial program plan. Um, those, those early action projects that will be like a single design package put together uh, for, you know, for that $4.7 million worth of work. So we will have a single package of, you know, similar to how, Jeff went through the 2021 sewer improvements, we'll have um, you know, a handful of projects across these three planning areas that will be implemented in a single package. And um, so that's uh, currently working uh, with um, the, the design firms here to, um, you know, to, to get that under uh, design work there. So yeah, I can um, talk to directly whoever was asking that question um, about that in more detail offline. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, nothing new. I, I did put in the chat feature, uh, just for reference, the, the Capital Region Water uh, current projects page. So there's a link in there if anyone can, can grab that out. But no more questions have come yeah. through. So we don't have any other questions. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. Um, well, if there's no more questions in the chat feature, I had put um, my email address, um, Claire's email, Jeff, and he added his phone number and things. So our contact information is in the chat. This um, event was um, recorded.
So we'll figure out how to, um, like, I guess, get the recording and send it. Um, if uh, people, you know, can email me and request a recording if they would like. Um, one of the things that did come up was that there wasn't enough time and some of the, um, their time ran out. Um, and then we had, um, I believe it was Misha. <laughs> she just tend to um, got the same people. So um, I do have the registrations of everyone that had registered and that participated for the day. So give me some time to create um, some type of document so that I can let everyone know who was actually um, registered on the um, uh, present for the event today. Um, if there's no other questions, I would like to thank HRG, um, uh, Freddie Lutz from PenBid and all the other, um, the engineering team and everyone else that helped coordinate this event today. Um, it was, it, um, it wasn't, it wasn't hard, but there was a lot of um, variables and things with using technology and not being able to meet in person. I appreciate the weekly meetings, um, especially, um, you know, from the, from the whole um, team that put it all together today, Tanya and Dave, and if I missed you, I apologize, but there were a lot of people that um, helped, you know, bring it together and, you know, get the technology and, and things together. Um, so I very much appreciate that, Wendy. <laughs> so um, I don't have anything else, um, but you all have my contact information. And um, just uh, very grateful to have all of you all in the line. And I hope that you got something out of it today. You never know what can come from it. Um, and with that, I don't have anything else. So um, and have some lunch and enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Nice meeting everyone. No Thanks, Thank Jarvis. You. Thank you, Jarvis. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See ya. Good job. Thanks. Sure. This is, I'm assuming everyone is in. Yes, okay. so far we have 29 participants. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. You're muted. I noticed it keeps bouncing the mute on and off when it comes in and out of the uh, rooms. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay.